Hello, and welcome to the Natural State Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin. It is my belief that the natural state of any living organism is health, and that our artificial habitat has forced us into having artificial health problems. This show is my attempt to dive deep and learn about using nutrition, sleep, movement, relationships, and more to help you reclaim your natural state of health in a modern world and show you how to thrive in an environment that's stacked against you. If you enjoyed today's show, you can find out more details and information at DrAnthonyGustin.com. Today we have Paul Saladino on the show. Paul is my resident carnivore MD expert, and this guy just lives and sleeps and breathes this stuff. He is always up in the latest research on the latest science. He's the most knowledgeable person in this topic that I can find. We did an episode, you know, a couple months ago, 20, 30 episodes back. So if you're new to the carnivore diet, don't know where to start, I will listen to that one first and then tune into this one. This one, we sort of refresh everything new that has happened since that episode, all the latest critiques in the carnivore diet, but most importantly, dive into the sustainability around animal production and the importance of having animals on the land. Paul is not against plant eating. He is just, you know, he goes through, you know, if you are a carnivore diet or animal based diet, what you can do to sort of limit your plant toxic load. This is a whole big point of view is that every plant sort of have some amount of toxins. And so he wants to have everybody just be as healthy as possible. And if you want to eat plants, no big deal. And he has in. So tune into this one and, you know, hope you learned something. He has a new book called The Carnivore Code that's dropping soon. And I hope you pick that up. If you have any questions about the carnivore diet, Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to tell you about how you can directly support the show. It is not free to produce this podcast, and I don't want to use the typical model of selling your attention to sponsors to fund the show. I want you to be able to take all of my health recommendations seriously without wondering if I'm being paid to promote something to you. If you want to support the team that is behind this podcast, head on over to either one of the brands that I've founded at perfectketo.com or equipfoods.com. I've developed the products for each of these companies with my insanely high standards because I couldn't find them anywhere else. Perfect Keto offers everything you need to support a whole foods-based ketogenic diet from exogenous ketones that help you transition into keto and boost your energy to super clean collagen bars that have been tested not to spike your blood sugar. It's literally the only bar that I know of that won't, and that's why I made it. Over at Equip Foods, we take real food ingredients seriously. You'll find only whole food ingredients like beef protein powder, sweet potato powder, grass-fed liver capsules, and more. If it's your first time trying the products at either one of these brands, Use code NATURALSTATE for 20% off your first order. And if you feel amazing focusing on 100% real foods, awesome. These products are intended to support a proper foundation of health and nutrition, and they are not magic pills. All right, enough of that. Let's get into the show. Paul. Anthony's like zen out. Of course I am. New year, new me, man. I know, right? So we have Paul Saladino here. We're um, a lamb liver this time. No lamb liver. No gifts, man. What the hell? If I'd known... (laughs) I would have, if I'd planned a little better, I would have brought you some. Uh, at, uh, at the house, we've got thymus, we've got trimmings, we've got liver, we've got kidney. We've got all kinds of good stuff. At the place you're staying? Yeah, at the place I'm staying. I'm staying with Kurt. And you just have that in general or? Yeah, I usually, I'm a carnivore too. So okay. Have so we have a non-miked up guy who's saying he's a, he's a carnivore, he's got all this stuff. Uh, so what, what's, the, what's the state of the carnivore, man? You're my most well-respected carnivore representative. So I wanted to tune in and see sort of what the latest is. I think you, you're always sort of at the cutting edge here. So It's fun stuff, man. It's January. So Joe Rogan is doing carnivore this month. I was hanging out with Kyle Kingsbury today. He when was, are you going to get on there? What's that? When are you going to get on Rogan, man? Oh, when, when he calls me, when he wants me to come on, man. Any open, day now. Open invitation, Joe. Open sure. invitation, Joe. I'd love to come on. He's a, he's a frequent listener to this show. <laughs> the... Uh, and it turns out, I think a bunch of the guys that Joe does Sober October with are also doing carnivore this month. So this is a big month for the carnivore diet. Isn't it also vegan wary? I think it is veganuary. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> Veganuary? Yes, yes. And, you know, since the Game Changers came out, I think a lot of people have been intrigued by vegan diets and are trying to do vegan diets now. And these are totally polar ideas. And so it's quite interesting to compare and contrast them. I think, as I've said in the past, I think anyone that makes an intentional dietary choice is moving in the right direction. And there's some nuance about pros and cons of plant-based diets and animal-based diets. Yeah. What's sort of interesting that I'm really realizing is that the vegan narrative since I got into nutrition, I don't know, maybe 10 plus years ago, has changed from vegans healthier to vegans more sustainable for the earth. And it's really shifting. So I even saw the other day, like the Golden Globes had 
vegan only meals and they didn't say for health reasons they said because it's more sustainable choice for the environment right one this is fucking ridiculous because there was estimated like 100 plus private jets that were flown in to do that there there was 750 limos in use like if you actually look at where carbon emissions are coming from, the vast majority is transportation and industry. Couldn't agree more. And But even when you look at an agriculture input, this doesn't shake out. Like, like I think the problem with both veganism, meat eating, et cetera, and nutrition as a whole, is that people don't sort of split this out. They just have one term for everything. So meat can mean commercially raised beef on one end of the spectrum. Then we start getting into like, grass-fed, biodynamic, and all the way on the other end of the spectrum, regenerative agriculture, which I think is a sort of a new term that people have no idea on, no concept on. And one pumps a lot of carbon in the atmosphere and one sucks a lot of carbon back into the soil and sequesters it. So you can actually eat in a way where you're eating animal products. I would say much better for the environment than eating tons of plants. I mean, yes, you can get plants of regenerative agriculture system as well, but like I see very few vegans who care about that and care about the actual soil, tillage, runoff, pesticides, herbicides, crop kills, monocropping, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm sure, I mean, we've sort of connected briefly a couple of times around our mutual fascination regarding- Love, our deep-seated yeah. love of regenerative agriculture. Yeah. Which is actually con confusingly rare in the carnivore community. Like I, 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 don't, I agree. I, don't, I, don't I agree. See it. I agree. The uh, um, the conversation is so fascinating because um, in the carnivore community, there are some people who are talking about this, but not as many as I would hope. And I think it's the one of the sharp points of the spear. And you highlighted so many good pieces there that we should touch on. But in the last chapter of my book, which is coming out in February, I'm super stoked about it. It's called The Carnivore Code. Um, we'll talk all about all the stuff I talk about in the book uh, in this podcast, but that you mentioned the tillage of the earth. So when we till the soil for monocrop agriculture, when we take a, a device that turns over the top layer of the soil, we are release, releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. I've never heard a plant-based person talk about that. And the amount of carbon that is stored in the soil, this is the major sink of carbon in the earth. It's the only thing that we can actually really control right now. It's, it's a huge thing, yeah. And there's a huge amount of carbon that comes out of the ocean and the carbon cycle, but no one, no one in the plant-based community is talking about the amount of carbon that is released into the atmosphere, and we can be talking about the carbon atom or carbon dioxide, when we till the soil. So you're, you're so right to highlight that monocrop agriculture, which is the way that most of the plants that we eat are grown, whether it's kale or soy or wheat or broccoli, these are monocrop systems. These are fields of broccoli as far as you can see. These are fields of kale as far as you can see. And that requires a tilling machine to go up and down, right? The, low, the rows of, of planted plants and move the soil to turn the soil up and over and release a whole bunch of carbon dioxide. And then what happens is because you're only doing one plant and there's no ecosystem, because there's no animal on that land to poop and eat the plants, you've created this fake ecosystem, right? An ecosystem needs plants and animals, but if you create a fake ecosystem with only plants, the plants will suck up the phosphorus and nitrogen and these other minerals from the soil and they will deplete the soil of minerals. It's like you're kind of taking these deposits out of the bank. If you don't have animals to put deposits back into the bank, which is what animals do in terms of the minerals and nutrients in the soil, you deplete the soil and you get monocropped agriculture contributing to topsoil erosion and depletion of nutrients. I mean, people have talked about the fact that we're at the cusp of basic collapse of agriculture mm -hmm. in the world, in this country specifically. And that the only reason that a lot of the soil in this country is still growing plants is because we're using ammonium nitrate fertilizer or NPK fertilizers, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium fertilizers on the land. We're sort of, we've had to give the, the land a blood transfusion because there's not enough animals on the land. There's no one's raising animals on the land to put things back in. Regenerative agriculture and regenerative farming is an ecosystem. It's animals on grass, which we know that, you know, grazing ruminant animals eat grass. So you have green plants growing, animals eating them, animals pooping, animals peeing, returning valuable nutrients into the soil, and then animals tilling the soil with their hooves without releasing the carbon in the way that a tilling machine will in a monocrop system. It's a completely different ecosystems-based approach, which leads to actual, as you know, 
improvement in soil quality, which is how we can fix carbon into the soil. It's the way it's supposed to be. Right. So I don't know if you know this since you've been on the podcast last time. Change the name to from Keto Answers to uh, The Natural State. And this is my whole philosophy around health. Like there's the natural state of any organism is health. And when we try to mess up the environment and change the environment, well, then we have a huge problem. And this is totally in line with human health. When you take a human out of its natural environment, it does not have natural health anymore. You, know, you don't have to work really hard for things to be healthy in a natural state. The same thing happens with the environment. And so when you're taking, again, a, an ecosystem that should have a lot of different plants on it, should have a lot of different animals on it. Like if you go away from the city and look around, there is no place where you have just one plant growing and nothing else around ever. Or animals in feedlot. Es especially year after year after year. And there's so many downstream consequences of this. The food is less nutritious. You know, it, there's more toxic load relative to nutrition in plants when people eat them. I mean, I'm sure you could talk about that all day long. There's, you know, re requirement of these fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides that then run off into our water streams. The soil and like the micro, the soils have microbiomes as well. All that stuff gets destroyed. You're basically taking this natural ecosystem and flipping it upside down completely. And the same thing happens if you take a human, put them in the city, they work in a cubicle, never get outside, never have light, touch their eyes or their skin, never have appropriate food, never Dirt. move. And you wonder why they're so sick. It's the same thing. Our planet is getting sick because we're taking all of our earth and turning it into and trying to feed people through this artificial system. I couldn't agree more, man. Um, I hope you'll come to White Oak Chella next year. It's in May. It's at this farm, White Oak Pastures in Georgia. And when I was there, I was learning from the guy that runs the farm, Will Harris. And one of the things he talks about is ecosystem-based approach to growing animals on the land. So it's not just cows on grass. Right. They rotate the cows, but they also will mix species in paddocks. So they'll have lamb and cow in the same paddock. And you think, well, okay, that kind of makes sense. But what's really cool is it starts to build an ecosystem. It's not a perfect ecosystem because it's not the wild, but it's closer. When you mix species on land, and I don't know how many farmers, ranchers are doing this in the United States right now. I don't think there's tons. What's so cool is that the cows get healthier and the lamb get healthier. And he did the same thing. He mixed lamb and uh, monogastric. So he mixed lamb and pigs and both of them got healthier. And he's kind of scratching his head going, why is this? It turns out that in ecosystems, in the natural world, there are parasites, right? Humans living in Africa, our indigenous ancestors, we all are experiencing parasitic infections. There are infectious etiologies that assault us. When you mix species, they interrupt the parasites from the other species. If you only have one species on the land, the parasite does its cycle and it can decrease the health of the animal. So when you put- Or plant. Or the plant, yeah. exactly. So when you put lamb and cow on the same paddock, there are two parasites. There's a brown stomach worm in cows and there's a barbapole pole worm in lamb. Well, they, these species don't cross infect. These species of parasites don't cross infect, right? So the brown stomach worm doesn't go to lamb and the barber pole worm can't live in cows. So what happens is that if a lamb ingests a brown stomach worm, a larva, it's just the life cycle is ending. The, the, it won't continue. And similarly, if a cow ingests a barber pole worm larva, the life cycle is stopped dead in its tracks. So what happens is that it's such an interesting uh, epitome or a model system of ecosystem in the natural world. They interrupt the respective parasites and both species become healthier. And this is what's so cool about regenerative agriculture is we're starting to think about how to raise animals, but it's just going back to what you're saying. It's like, oh, as soon as we started destroying ecosystems, we messed everything up and we have to think about how to get back to that in the best way possible. And so when we mix species, they fertilize the land. So it's better for the land. It's better for the animals and it's better for us because they make healthier food for humans. Yeah, and, and start fixing our environment as well. Exactly. And so it's, it's better for the land, better for the atmosphere around the land, better for the animals, and then better for the humans. It's like everything wins. You're like, oh, that's, that makes absolute sense. Every piece of the spoke of this wheel gets healthier. How could we not encourage that? Yeah. That to me is the most environmentally conscientious decision we can make. I hope the Golden Globes next year will support regenerative agriculture. Yeah, yeah. Somehow I o think over that... Over <laughs> veganism. Like, it's just like going vegan inherently has no fix to it. And this is sort of the same thing, like just generally going carnivore as well. It's like, you're not really like... Exactly. You're not voting with your dollar appropriately, in my opinion. And I know that everybody can't do that, but there's certain steps that you can take. 
Well, I want to talk about that too. Let's talk about that. So when I talk about eating carnivore, I, I advocate for farms like Belcampo in Northern California, um, White Oak in uh, Georgia, who are doing regenerative agriculture. People sometimes ask me, should I only eat grass-fed meat? And I say, well, look, where are your dollars going? What are you investing in? And the, I heard this on another podcast. The, the scenario is this. What if I ask the listener, would you um, accept $100,000 if I gave you diabetes? I think most people would say no. Diabetes is not worth 100,000. Mm -hmm. What about 500,000, a million? Like, you know, diabetes has complications. You have to take medications. It's going to affect your overall life. You could have amputations of toes. You know, diabetes, these are pretty big things. What if I gave you a million dollars to have rheumatoid arthritis? No, people would be like, no, no. And so what we realize then is we are already rich. If we have our health, we are already rich. And so what is it worth to invest in our health to maintain it? If we, if we are rich, we need to protect the investments that we have. We are already rich humans if we are healthy. And I think that we've gone a little bit astray in our value systems around food. I don't know why humans devalue food so much. It's like, do you have a nice car? Do you have a nice cell phone? Totally. So I completely agree with what you're saying. Like, I think that people who can afford it need to do that. Like, there's, there's I think, three main issues, four if you really want to get into it, with regenerative agriculture as it stands today. The first one I would say is a branding issue. When we're trying to communicate this stuff, you know, this I'd say it's like sort of at the stage where like when organic started 30, 40 years ago. But regenerative agriculture is nine syllables. Like it's ridiculous. You like just understanding what I know about marketing, like you're never gonna convince somebody to switch something who doesn't have time to research like we're doing when you have something that's nine syllables. It's just not gonna work. Um, so that's a problem. What should we call it? I, I'm, I have some thoughts. <laughs> They'll save those for later. Top secret. Yeah. Um, another one is the same with, you know, health in general, I think is very simple, but it's also the hardest thing to do in our natural, in, in, in our normal modern environment now. And so what happens is there's a lot of these fundamental things that I think are true that help people from like, if for instance, you have a kid right now and raise them and like they only eat real food, they're moving really in complex movements and they're sleeping a lot and like not in, in a lot of city environments, you're going to have a healthy person. However, when you go astray from that for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years, everyone has sort of an individual path back. And sometimes when people, you know, remove themselves from in instance, a proper movement environment, they may need to get better hip flexion or better hip extension. So like everybody's sort of different. And I think that agriculture in a way is also at that point where we've removed so many different regions in different ways from a natural environment and natural ecosystem that we're sort of like, we're still at the point where we need to figure out how to get each specific thing back and like have an individual path back to normalcy. So that's another problem. The third one is distribution. Um, so for example, so the third one's distribution, which will tie to the fourth one, which is supply chain. And I mean, this is something as, as running the company that I have, I just like have a sort of an intimate understanding of these problems. I was in New York recently, I flew into JFK and I don't know if anybody's been there, but if you if you drive from JFK to Manhattan or even to somewhere like in, in Brooklyn, you have like all of the people that you drive by, like most of the people in that region that you drive by are not having access to a lot of real food. They don't have the funds to buy the real food. Like even if we had 300 farms surrounding New York City, the distribution and supply changes does not support everybody being able to vote with their dollars. And so like, we need to have people who can afford it right now investing their time and resources so that way we can start getting the price down. Once you improve the supply chain, then you start improving distribution. But just like sort of how like Elon Musk right now, is not, this is, he does not give a shit how we're going to grow food on Mars. He's just worried about how to get there. You know? And I think that like we need to worry with regenerative agriculture right now, just how to get there. And then I think we'll start figuring out transportation stuff after that. I agree with you completely because a lot of times people try and short circuit this conversation when they ask me, can we feed everyone on the planet with regenerative agriculture? Can everyone on the planet eat a carnivore diet? And I think let's get to Mars first. Like you said, like we don't need to address that right now. First of all, everyone on the planet is never going to eat a carnivore diet. If 5% of the people eat a carnivore diet, we will change the world because the health of the people will improve so vastly. But let's just try and start with our families. Like let's just get to Mars first, right? Before we learn how to grow food on Mars, metaphorically, like get, Get yourself healthy, get your family healthy, get your community healthy, figure out what foods are the best, 
And then let's go from there and let's figure out how to scale it. Let's figure out how to make it more um, doable across the country and let's figure out how to get more people this type of food. But when people ask that, I think let's ask the questions that should come before that, before we ask that question, because right. my answer to that question is there is no food system that exists on this planet right now that can feed everyone on the planet in a healthful way. So we already do not have the answer. The yeah. question sort of presupposes. I'm going to pause you for a second there and like you said in a healthy way. Yeah. Yeah. And that is an important distinction. Like we can keep, keep people alive with the food system we have right now, but the food system itself is not sustainable. Like we it also might it. collapse. Exactly. As, as topsoil collapses and mm -hmm. as, you know, so we, we can keep people alive, but for how much longer? Like we probably can't even continue the monocrop agriculture system in the, in the world that we're doing right now for much longer. Right. And then what we'll start doing is growing plants indoors at scale to feed people, trying to mimic a complex system of nature. It'll probably be missing a lot of weird things and make people really sick. Like you think, you think plants make people sick now. Wait till we start making them indoors with GMO things that don't get access to sunlight and like are on some weird seed basis. Like well, we're, we're going to be living like sort of a dystopian future, in my opinion, in not too long uh, decades, I would say, not even centuries, like decades, if we don't start really thinking about this stuff in a very different way. I agree with you. I mean, the people need to take a sobering, honest look at the sustainability of a monocrop agriculture plant system now. And this is, again, what's left out of the plant-based conversations is, number one, as we talked about in this podcast, they are saying that animal agriculture puts more carbon into the environment than plants, which may be true. We can talk about the carbon cycle and the nuances there. As we are discussing, the real conversation around carnivore and animal-based diets is let's support the agriculture which does not do that. And then the next conversation, which is always left out of these plant-based conversations, is if you theoretically eliminated all animals from the face of the planet, ecosystems would collapse because monocropping would expand and soils would become more depleted. People would become much less nutritionally nourished and you would have to expand plant agriculture. And so the carbon emissions would increase, right? So there is no, there's no simple equation that gets us out of this. This is a Gordian knot that people are trying to oversimplify by pointing the finger at agriculture and it's become uh, at animal-based agriculture. And it's become a little bit frustrating. It's just like, you guys are missing the point. This is not that simple. Yeah. I mean, I think that like, I'm not one to judge if people want to be vegetarian or vegan or eat primarily plant-based diets. But if that's the case, you need to vote with your dollar the same way that I am. Like that's the standard that I hold people to. If that's the case, you should be going to farms and participating in this ecosystem. And if you're just eating impossible burgers with vegetable oil and a bunch of chemicals with soy from the GMO soy from, from these huge monocrops, like you are part of the problem. Did you see, did you see the post I did on Instagram uh, about a month ago? So James Wilkes, the guy that did game changers, this so popular. you challenged him to, to an arm wrestling match. <laughs> <laughs> challenged him to, yeah. <laughs> no, so his wife posted on her Instagram about a year ago, publicly, she posted on Instagram a picture of her cart at Costco, right? How the Wilkes family eats. The Wilkes family goes shopping. And look, like, James, I know you're listening to this. I want to debate James Wilkes, right? I want to do it on Rogan. Like, there's the picture we're showing you. This is the cart oh. of, and people can look at this. It's on my Instagram. So, like James Wilkes' family is clearly not voting with their dollars. This honey, is the honey nut Cheerios, like processed granola bars, big things of ketchup, which fruit, has cor corn syrup. Fruit sure. roll-ups. Yeah. There's not a single vegetable. Bagels, applesauce. This, yeah, this is absurd. <laughs> and, and this is the family... Okay, maybe it's changed, but this was a year ago. They were vegetarian. They were vegan at this time. Like, this is the guy who's promoting Game Changers, and they're completely missing the point that they're not voting with their dollars. This is not healthy, quote-unquote, plant-based food. This is not even plant-based food that thinks about how we grow vegetables, how we grow plants in the broader ecosystem at all. Yeah. Like, that's, that's absolutely contributing to the change. And I love you said this a few times. Vote with your dollars is... I can't think of a more true phrase. And if you can't, that's okay. Do the best you can, for sure. I'm not trying to be elitist and saying that you have to do this or else. Right, right. But if you can, you should. If you can, I you can, should. So I do. Like, if you can, you should. And like I said earlier, there's relative ways to do this, right? I was talking with Kyle in the car. I mean, you can get grass-fed ground beef at Whole Foods for six ninety nine a pound. And a pound of ground beef for $7 is is more expensive than a Whopper at Burger King, but there's a lot more nutrition in there. So let's just think about like, I really think somebody could eat an entirely animal-based diet and still vote with their dollars for about $12 a day. Yeah, I mean, I think that, so I was recently in Oregon, I in, in the woods doing nothing. I 
was eating force of nature meat, so I had that ship there. Which is from Rome Ranch, right? Yeah, and, and a bunch of other. So they source from a bunch of like a diverse mm -hmm. range of regenerative agriculture um, farms. And so like all of their meat is from regenerative agriculture systems. They have elk, they have venison, they have bison, they have beef. Amazing. And they have ancestral blends where it mixes stuff in. And I just ate two two packs of those a day. I think the beef is eight ninety nine, and then I had four eggs and a can of oysters. And so call it like, like you said, like on the lowest end, 12 bucks, this was like 20 bucks a day for me. And it was like, this is like the highest end stuff you could buy. And that's pretty high end. Yeah. This is high, high, again, the highest end and it's being shipped. And it's like, like, I would like to remove myself from, from that system of like, I don't want to ship frozen food around the world to, to me if I don't have to, but like, I don't want to think about sourcing meat. Like I, I looked at butcher shops in Oregon. There was in Portland. There was none that existed that I knew of that were doing meat the way I wanted to. So I think like shipping regenerative agriculture meat is better than eating meat that's not done that way. Yes. Um, but if like you know here in in Austin, like I go hunting or and get my own meat, that that part of a, a normal ecosystem, I'd say. Or there's a bunch of ranches like Chickamau Ranch around here is really good. Bar Three Ranch is pretty good. I'm sure you probably know of a few. Uh, but I mean, there's, there's options. If you go to eatwild.com is a good it. place yep. that you can find ranches usually around you and even get it cheaper in many cases. Buy a quarter of a yeah, cow, yeah, buy a half yeah, a cow. Split. And if you can't split it with, like, find some people in your area, go on Facebook, go on Craigslist, try to split an animal. We do it with a lot of our members at Perfect Keto usually go in and, and a whole animal and the cost is just driven down and it goes like three bucks a pound. And then let's let's transition, or maybe this is a good segue into the relative value of animal foods versus plant foods. If you go to the grocery store and you buy a head of kale, that's like two to three dollars for a head of kale. You can get almost half a pound of grass-fed ground beef for that, which is more nutritious, hands down. I mean, I'm open to your opinion if you disagree yeah, with this. Yeah, but I mean, for for sure. I mean, I think that I've talked about like my totem pole of nutrition before. I don't know if I've ever told you about sort of my thoughts on this, but it's like. Organ meat's top, all animal products that are like underneath that. Right. And then even when you get into plant foods and you look at, you know, nutrient density, it's spices and herbs. And I know you, like, you could sit, you could have a, an analogous toxic load one, but like when you're looking at like nu nutrient density per gram, then you have sort of dark leafy greens and vegetables. And then you start going down and down and down. You have grains, legumes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which some of these things are just like, for how much like you can only eat so much in a day and when you eat like you're sort of voting like i only have so much stomach capacity i only have so much i can eat and if you're eating at the lower end of the the spectrum on nutrient density no matter what your nutritional philosophy is you're just not treating your body as well it's like that i just want to opt for eating higher in that totem pole and that's just animal products and that's just the way it is i don't think that humans have a lot of calories to waste Exactly. To tell you the truth, I think that most of us can eat between 1,600 and 3,000 calories a day if we go, you know, the full spectrum. And to get all of the nutrients that we know in 2020 you need to thrive in 1,600 calories is not even, not an easy task if you waste calories on empty foods. You have a small allotment of food. You know, if you're up at 3,000 calories a day, you're, a, you're presumably a bigger person or maybe you're exerting more. But if we're just talking nuts and bolts, vitamins and minerals that your body needs to thrive, and then we'll talk about macros, carbs, protein, and fat that your body needs to thrive, omega-3s, et cetera, et cetera. Like, it's actually hard or it, it is an intentional process to create a diet that of around 2,000 calories to get all of that. If you put empty foods in your diet, and I would put a lot of, like you said, grains, these foods are very empty. Even legumes I would qualify as quite empty on many nutrients. You're, you're bankrupting yourself in a lot of ways. You are not uh, setting yourself up to be optimal function optimally in any way, shape, or form because of the lack of nutrients in your diet. You just won't get enough. And I like your nutrient hierarchy. When we construct it like that, in my book, I have a plant toxicity hierarchy that we can also talk about as well. I think it's quite interesting to think about which plants might be more and less toxic. I'll come back to that concept. But in the book, I show DIAS scores, which is digestible, indispensable amino acid scores. I did a whole podcast in response to the Wilkes and Cresser podcast on Rogan. People heard James Wilkes talk about the DIAS score. He was incorrect. 
Uh, the DIAS score is very often calculated by foods that are cooked. It is calculated with hydrolyzed soybeans. These are not the, there is a huge drop off. The DIAS score is a score that we use to estimate the protein utilization. Sort of the ability of the body to use nitrogenous compounds, specifically amino acids in proteins in animal foods relative to plant foods. And it's a, it's a extreme drop off. It's like you're walking along and then it just drops off the edge of a chasm when you go from animal foods, which have DIAS scores of one or above, and you go to plant Plant foods, and this is this is a very accurate score. James Wilkes is trying to claim that there is a drop off because of digestive enzyme inhibitors in the plant foods, and that in the foods studied they were not cooked, which is incorrect. If you actually go to the data, the plant foods, the soy and the beans that were looked at for the DIAS scores were cooked. They were hydrolyzed. They are digestible. It is not the digestive enzyme inhibitors that make them look that way. It is the fact that amino acids in plants are less bioavailable to humans. So, and then also in my book, I have a comparison of the net utilization of iron between heme iron and non-heme iron in plants and animal foods. Again, it's the same model. You're walking along and it drops off a cliff. Animal foods have much more bioavailable iron. It's really this way for the majority of the nutrients across the board. And so on, on the totem pole that you were constructing, I think we have organ meats and animal foods. Uh, other animal muscles at the top. And then there's a big drop off. There's like an empty part of the totem pole. You know, it's not analog. You know, it's like, there's not this continuum. It's like, you know, you're walking along and then it drops off a cliff. And this is difficult to quantify objectively, but there's a big empty space on that totem pole when you get to plant foods in terms of nutrient bioavailable, availability, nutrient density. And we can think about which nutrients specifically we're talking about, but there's a large open space there. Yeah. So as far as since last time we got you on the show, what has changed in your mind as far as practical application of a carnivorous diet or nutrition in general? So I've, I think that the longer that I've thought about a carnivore diet, the more I've become mellow about it. And I've, <laughs> I'll, doesn't I'll, sound like it. <laughs> maybe yeah. it's, <laughs> it's how you qualify it. Right. I think that at the, in that podcast, we probably defined a carnivore diet, and I'll just I'll define a carnivore diet to put this in context, and that previous statement will make sense. So, strictly speaking, I would define a carnivore diet as a diet that has no plant foods. It's all based on animal foods. More, more broadly speaking, I think you could think about a carnivore-inspired diet or a carnivore-ish diet, which I think is probably going to be the sweet spot for most people, which realizes that the majority of our nutrients are from animal foods, that yeah. the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet, the most nutrient-rich foods on the planet are animal foods from well-raised sources. And if you're going to eat plants, consider those plants along a spectrum of toxicity. So for me, the carnivore diet is what I've gotten very interested in. I'm still full carnivore. I don't include plants in my diet. I've done a few, uh, specifically three carbohydrate reintroduction experiments, which I can talk about. But I, I think that the as I've gotten more into the carnivore diet, I've gotten more interested in the spectrum of plant toxicity and helping people understand. I think most people can get on board, perhaps not plant-based advocates, but many people can get on board that animal foods are very nutritious, right? But I think that what's... Uh, I don't know, man. It's a tough sell. It, maybe, it's, people, yeah. maybe it's getting to be more and more tough, but I don't think that that's very debatable. As you said, most plant-based memes, most plant-based... Uh, paradigms have shifted away from a vegan diet is more healthy because you can, that's very, yeah. that's on very shifty sand ground. So it's, it's still tough though. Like I'm, I'm going to go speak at, in front of the USDA in a couple of weeks regarding the nutrition guidelines and give my sort of expert opinion on them. And I was researching a lot as far as like what the government put out in 2015 for the, every five years, they reset the nutrition guidelines and it still says to limit animal protein limit animal foods because un unhealthy and the saturated fat is sort of the biggest claim. And so this is still like our government pushes that that's what schools teach people. That's know. what, that's what schools feed their children. Like that's what goes to medical educations. Like, I mean, this stuff is, it's real. And I think that we still have a huge problem with that. You're right. You're right. But I mean, and as far as like the, the toxicity scale of plants, I mean, this is one of those things where like, and Jordan, I'd like to get your opinion on this too. Like, I, cause I, I've also like thought through this more and more over the last few months. And it's absurd that I can travel around the country, around the world, essentially. And I go to a grocery store and I, mean, I eat like 99% real food. And every, there's like maybe 10 to 20 like common vegetables that are from the same source that are, you can buy in any single store anywhere else. And so 
thinking about this just in the past of like, okay, like looking at our ancestral populations, like probably ate a very, very diverse things. Like sort of like you're talking about where like you have the beef with a certain parasite and the pork with a certain parasite and sort of cancel each other out. Like when you start getting plants that are grown in normal environments that are very different. So the person actually makes eatwild.com, Joe Robinson has a good, phenomenal book. I don't know if you've read it called Eating on the Wild Side. That sort of like breaks down like how far we've gotten away from plants as they used to exist in nature and like how they're made right now to be like big and juicy and edible and shippable and all this other stuff. And so people are eating the same exact thing every single day that's nutrient poor and probably toxicity high. So have you looked into the data around sort of like ancestral populations and the plants that they were eating and how that compares to now? Like like how much of the gap there is between like increased or decreased toxic load? Um, like, like what sort of insights have you gleaned there? I think it's a big issue. If you even look at animals, animals don't eat the same plant. Yeah. Animals exactly. graze. If you put animals on a paddock of land, they're going to move around. You know, cows eat a lot of grass, but like lamb and sheep, they'll eat a little bit of this plant, a little bit of that plant. And they realize that if they overeat one plant, they will become sick. And so plants have toxins. This is not debatable. To eat kale every day is a horrible idea and completely evolutionarily inconsistent. So if we look at indigenous hunter-gatherers, and there are lots of nuanced discussions here, they, they, did, they ate plants seasonally, right? So there were only certain plants available at certain times of the year. They ate fruit seasonally, which was only available very rarely. And the plants are very rare. I think that in indigenous cultures, they don't eat a lot of leaves, first of all, which is why leaves are kind of high on my plant toxicity spectrum. They may eat more tubers, but and they don't eat a lot of grains because they're really hard to cook. Yeah, they're you not, break your teeth on them. If you they're eat not eating grain. seeds, right? I mean, they're not going to go to the effort of doing this. In indigenous cultures, generally what is eaten in the plant kingdom is tubers and fruits when they're available. You know, things like, and maybe nuts occasionally when they're available, but it's pretty rare that they're going to eat hard seeds. They're not going to eat grains, but maybe nuts, maybe tubers, maybe fruit occasionally. They don't eat a lot of leaves. Um, leaves are fairly toxic and a lot of a lot of these other plants can be toxic, but we're eating a lot of leaves these days. We're eating a lot of kale leaves and things that are made from kale leaves or things that are from the brassica family. So I think that, again, even when we're eating plants, you bring up a good point here. We are eating them in a way that is evolutionarily inconsistent. And so in the plant toxicity spectrum that I construct in the book, tubers are one of the things that are generally less toxic. They still have some oxalates, but I think they're less toxic. People can react to nightshade vegetables if they eat potatoes, but things like sweet potatoes or squash, if you get rid of the seeds and the skin, that's a fairly evolutionarily consistent plant to eat. Mm -hmm. I still think that it's a, it's a subpar food and we're just aiming at carbohydrates. It's a survival food, but it's a less toxic survival food than plants. In the wild, in indigenous cultures, when people are trying to survive, they don't go around eating leaves from plants. They're astringent, they're bitter, they make people vomit. A lot of them are toxic. They're, they don't taste good. I mean, kale on its own when it's raw is bitter and just, it, it, it doesn't taste good. Yeah, but they've also used, like, I mean, this is, some of them were necessary for survival in a certain respect. So like, yes. for instance, using certain plants to kill bacteria. As a medicinal use. Right. Yes. Yeah. Or even like in food. So like spices and herbs, like especially like Indian cuisine. Like that's why there's so much aromatic spices and herbs there to basically buffer out all of, of the crazy health problems that the, you know, the farming agriculture problems had when it was coming out. Yeah. And probably antiparasitics. I mean, we know that indigenous cultures suffer from more parasites and there's some fascinating studies um, on the Simene and the Yoruba, the Simene are Bolivian, the Yoruba are... Uh, I believe in Nigeria, um, uh, looking at the parasitic burden. And incidentally, in those people, uh, APOE4 is protective for cognitive mm -hmm. things. So that's kind of a, an intellectual leap. But we know that parasite burdens are high and that um, I think that a lot of the plants were used to combat that in humans. And if we're not having a parasite burden, do we need less of the plants? Our food is not as dirty as it was. We don't need things in the plants to, we don't need these things in the plants to kill the food right. if we're raising it in a certain way. And if we look at the way indigenous cultures eat plants, they're usually having some knowledge or sense that they do have toxins and they're doing things to detoxify. They're fermenting. A lot of plants get fermented. This is the origin of sauerkraut and kimchi and things like this. When we ferment cabbage, the fermentation process degrades glucosinolates. So glucosinolates are the precursor, like glucoraphanin is a glucosinolate. Glucosinolates are the precursors to isothiocyanates. Isothiocyanates, people may be familiar with sulforaphane or goitrin. Um, but what happens in 
brassica vegetables is glucosinolates combined with the enzyme myrosinase when the plant is chewed, not native plant, but the, this is a booby trap, right? So glucosinolates combined with myrosinase when the plant is chewed and form isothiocyanates, which are a plant defense molecule. These are phytoalexins. Sulforaphane is a plant defense molecule. And we can talk about um, the sort of pros and cons of hormesis and debate that. But when we ferment cabbage, broccoli, sauerkraut, or into sauerkraut, or when you ferment, if you fermented kale or any brassica vegetable, when you ferment it, glucosinolates are degraded and the plants are quote unquote detoxified in a way. They're going to have less of these isothiocyanates, which will move around the body and inhibit the absorption of iodine right. at the level of the thyroid and do other things. Yeah. And as far as, you know, all these different pathways too, what I think people don't appreciate, and I don't know if you've done any research on this, is the genetic variability. And this is like you're talking about, you know, some cultures ate tubers, some cultures ate a lot of fruits and like high, high in coconut or like, for instance, the Catavans or, you know, everybody likes to quote how long they, they live and like Okinawans, et cetera, in what they're eating is like very, very different from a carnivorous diet. But the thing that people don't understand is like, it, your genes are probably not their genes. You know, it's, you get, you get some of these people who, for example, you take somebody who's Japanese and you have a Japanese family or a Japanese like a couple families and you move them to Nebraska and you don't have them breed with any other people around like they're just there they will look Japanese in 300 years so if they look a certain way on the outside don't you think that inside their ability to eat certain foods is very different you know what I mean and so it's like I certainly think yeah yeah and so whereas you know, a lot of Americans, especially Western world, come from and have their genes in an area where we have really long winters. We have, we don't have availability to plant foods the majority of the year. It was way easier just to kill animals. We've come out of just a 20,000 year ice age. Exactly. And so what, I mean, what have you seen there as far as cultures maybe that you've studied or genetic variability and people who can maybe tolerate more plants or less plants or more carbohydrates or less carbohydrates? And I, you know, I say tolerate, and some people I'd say maybe even thrive on. I think this is a very important point. There's a gene, I'm forgetting the name. It has a CH in it. Uh, I can find it to you and you can put it in the show notes. It's called the, it's like the hunter versus the farmer gene. Mm. Somebody sent me a message about it on Facebook. Will you look it up? Kurt, we've got our little, our little, uh, I got our assistant here on the side. This is our <laughs> Jamie over here. Look at this gene. Uh, it's like the hunter versus the farmer gene. And we'll tell you guys what the name of it is. But it has to do with the tolerance of carbohydrates, right? And so people who are descended from, from ancestors who have been eating consistently carbohydrate high diets or farming for more generations consistently may be able to tolerate more carbohydrates. They more have, may have evolved this. I still believe that at our core, we are humans and that all humans have evolved in a way, or all humans have come from an ancestral lineage that became human because we were eating meat. We can look at the size of the human brain and the huge uptick in the size of the human brain based on the fossil record that began 1.9 million years ago when we see the concurrent evidence for stone tools and hunting and butchering of animals. And there are so many things in the ancestral fossil record that go back to two, 2 million years ago, basically when Homo habilis and Homo erectus were around. Let's say humans were eating meat and that's when our brains got much, much bigger. Over the next million years, they went from 600 cc's to about 1,000 cc's. And so I think that we're all derived from an ancestral lineage of people, from a people that ate animals at its core, that animals made us human. I think that on top of that, some people can tolerate more plants based on their genetic, but my hypothesis is that basically everybody on the earth will thrive on animal foods, okay? So the name of this gene is CHC22, and it's, um, it, there is a, uh, it has to do with clathrin, um, and uh, it's a clathrin-associated uh, transporter or receptor, I believe, and it has to do with glucose metabolism. So people can look this up, CHC22, and I think that on top of that ancestral blueprint, there are some people who can tolerate more plants and some people who are not going to be able to tolerate plants, and people will probably know which they can do. And I think there are some people who can thrive on a more plant-based diet or a less plant-based diet. I think that in general, if we completely eliminate animal foods, we're not going to do well, but I think that the majority of us have at our core an ancestral blueprint and ancestral programming, which is going to allow us to thrive on animal foods. And the layers on top of that are how many plants we can tolerate. Because some yeah. people clear, seem to do okay and some people just do horribly. And I think that there's been, you know, 
we live in a cosmopolitan world. There's so much mixing of genetics now, which is a great thing that it's hard to tease out this person versus that person. But I think we could, at a basic level, we could look and say, if you are from a lineage of people from Iceland, right? Or if you're Nordic and your family is pretty much consistently Nordic, your ancestors did not eat a lot of plants, right? If you are from people who are consistently Mediterranean, your ancestors might have had plants and maybe you're gonna tolerate more plants. If you have this certain polymorphism of CHC22, maybe you're gonna be able to tolerate more carbs than other people. Ultimately, it's about figuring out what we thrive on. Yeah. But for me, I think the basic bottom part of the pyramid is that everybody can do well on animal foods and we can add to that as we tolerate. What about the, you know, some people get like a 23 and me test, they right. upload their, their stuff and do a certain thing. And it says, oh, you have this polymorphism. And there's a couple of them that you shouldn't eat as much saturated fat. Those are quite misleading. So these I talk about in my book, the two big ones are APOE4 and FTO. So FTO is the fat mass and obesity associated gene. And, and APOE4 is a, is an isotype or an isoform of APOE, which is a, um, a apolipoprotein that is found on our uh, on lipoproteins in our body. It's found on LDL, and it's also found in the brain. And it moves cholesterol between um, particles in or between compartments. So in the brain, it moves cholesterol between astrocytes and neurons. And so I'll talk about APOE4 first. So I did a whole podcast on APOE4 with my buddy Tommy Wood. And if you, this is what's so hard and frustrates me so much about mainstream media is they'll make these claims and then you dig into it and it's based on epidemiology, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that APOE4, in epidemiologic studies, APOE4 is a risk factor for dementia. In fact, if you're heterozygous or if you're homozygous, meaning you have one or two uh, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, APOE4, in the general population, you have a much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia. Now, not everybody who has APOE4 gets Alzheimer's dementia. And as I mentioned earlier, in populations that have been studied of indigenous people, specifically the Simane, T-S-I-M-A-N-E, and then Yoruba, Y-O-R-U-B-A, which is, I believe, a Nigerian population, APOE4 polymorphisms are protective for cognitive and other decline. The people with APOE4 have lower levels of inflammation and preserve cognitive function longer in those indigenous peoples. So we see a very different picture for APOE4 when we are insulin sensitive, right? And most of the research that is done in the West is on populations which are broadly insulin resistant. So how do these connect? What do we know about Alzheimer's dementia? It's also been called type three diabetes, quote unquote, to sort of succinctly summarize the fact that in Alzheimer's dementia, we see insulin resistance developing in the brain, meaning that the brain is not able to traffic glucose as well, is not as sensitive to the actions of insulin. The brain is becoming resistant to insulin. And so what happens there? This is basically all connected in the fact that people with APOE4 appear to develop brain insulin resistance more easily than people who don't have APOE4. They're more insulin resistant, and they're probably more insulin resistant systemically. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you can't eat saturated fat. It just means that the people in epidemiology studies who eat saturated fat eat saturated fat with a bunch of other junk food. This is the problem with, right? With, right? And that's why the nutritional guidelines and reviewing have thrown the baby out of the bathwater. Exactly. There's nothing directly toxic about saturated fat. Our body makes saturated fat. Saturated fat are long chain fats that don't have any double bonds between carbons. Yeah, not only that, we're made of a lot of saturated fat. We're made of a lot of saturated fat. We have a lot of saturated fat in our body. Saturated we, fat is yeah. not toxic to humans. There are different lengths of chains of saturated fat. They change lipids in different ways, whether you're talking about lauric or meristic or caprylic or uh, palmitic acid. These are all different lengths of chains of saturated fat, but saturated fat is not toxic to the human body. In fact, I would argue that the reverse is potentially true, that if we try and put too much vegetable oil in our diet, if we try and put too much monounsaturated or polyunsaturated fatty acid in our diet, then we see more oxidation. And I know I'm kind of off on a tangent, but I want to talk about one study real quickly. This is super fascinating. So this study looked at LP little a, and they looked at oxidized LDL. Now we're kind of segueing into lipids a little bit. And they looked at these markers in people who were eating 29 grams of saturated fat a day. And they had two groups of people. They dropped one group of people down to 20 grams of saturated. They dropped both groups of people. They took 30% of their saturated fat out. So they dropped both groups to 20 grams or less of saturated fat a day. And one group ate a lot of plants or a lot of fruits and vegetables. And one great group ate less fruits and vegetables. So there's two interventions here. Basically what happened is in both groups, when saturated fat was lower, what do you think happened to oxidized LDL and LP little a? I'll just 
preface that for people. LP little a is a marker. It's generally felt to be a marker of oxidative stress. We don't really understand what LP little a does. It's an LDL molecule with an, a lipoprotein little a attached, which looks like plasminogen in the human body. So it's probably involved in clotting and it may be a scavenger for oxidized phospholipids. So LP little a and oxidized LDL may be telling us about the same thing. What do you think happened to these people when they decreased saturated fat and oxidized LDL and LP little a? They probably died. They died. <laughs> Both of the measures went up. So LP little a went up and oxidized LDL went up. So basically everybody listening to this right. podcast, if they have a knowledge of this, physician, scientist, will not disagree with me when I say that LP little a and oxidized LDL are usually considered to be bad. Mm -hmm. You decrease saturated fat in the diet and both of those go up. How can we explain that? Well, it's very easy to explain because if you increase, if you enrich your lipoproteins with polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fatty acids, they become oxidized more easily. And this is very well documented. The diets rich in linoleic acid, which is an omega-6, right, fatty acid, are create more linoleic acid in LDL particles, and those LDL particles oxidize like gangbusters. Which is you know found in most vegetable oils in very high amounts. Very, it's high. It's high in vegetables and vegetable oils, and a lot of nuts and seeds are high in linoleic acid, right? And so what we're seeing here is that saturated fat, the balance. It's not that any of these fats are bad. We need omega six in our diet. We need some amount of omega three in our diet. We need some amount of saturated fat in our diet. But I think that we need to think about. When the conversation around fatty acids has to be what is the ancestral ratio and how does it affect metrics around oxidized LDL, around markers of inflammation. It's been shown that when we enrich our LDL with linoleic acid, which is what the cardiologist would tell us to do because it will lower LDL, your serum LDL in terms of milligrams per deciliter will go down if you guzzle linoleic acid, right? If you guzzle canola oil, if you guzzle corn oil, your LDL will go down but more of it will be oxidized. And I've talked about this on multiple podcasts on my channel, that LDL number is a horrible predictor of cardiovascular disease. Triglyceride to HDL ratio is a much better indicator. What is triglyceride to HDL ratio indicating? Insulin sensitivity. So, I mean, what do you say to the people like, uh, I can't even think about anybody off the top of my head, but there's a lot who's, you know, as it's a, something that is necessary for plaques to form, for instance. In, LDL? Yeah. And so like, if you have it, like, yes, it's like, you're not guaranteed, but it's a required molecule. So why wouldn't you also try to have it as low as humanly You're never going to have no LDL in your body. Right. Of course, right. Not, you don't want right. zero. Right. But so LDL is necessary, but not sufficient. Right. Correct. Right. So here's the deal. Let's talk about the numbers of LDL. This is fascinating, right? So when you do an NMR lipid profile, it will tell you in nanomole per liter, how many LDL particles you have in your body. Right, So this is nanomole is 10 to the minus ninth. Moles is 10 to the 26th because it's Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 26th. So you can calculate, if you, have, if you see on your NMR profile, which is a very sophisticated LDL profile, you can calculate the number of LDL particles in your body, okay? Let's just say you have an, an NMR profile which shows you have an LDL P, an LDL particle count of 1,000 nanomole per liter. That's essentially equivalent, this is a back of the envelope calculation, I've done it before, it's around 17 trillion, or it's, it's on the order of 10 to the 18th or 10 to the 17th molecules of LDL in your body. 10 to the 17th or 10 to the 18th molecules of LDL in your body. This is a very big number, okay? If you lower that LDL particle count, right? This is LDLP from one, an LDLP of 1,000 is pretty acceptable to most physicians. Let's increase that LDL and let's, let's triangulate. I know this is getting complicated. Bear with me, guys. I'll make it more in, more more accessible. So let's, let's just, if you assume that your LDL is about 22 nanometers big, right? If we talk about LDL size, then an LDL particle number of a thousand nanomole per liter is about an LDL of around hundred milligrams per deciliter. Most people, when they get the LDL panel is going to see hundred milligrams per deciliter. That's about an LDL P of a thousand nanomole per liter, assuming your LDL particle size is around 22, give or take, right? Let's increase your LDL to 200. Okay. Like we are talking about now your LDLP is going to go to 2000 nanomole per liter. And the number of LDL particles in your, in your body is going to go from one times 10 to the 18th to two times 10 to the 18th, right? You just doubled the number, but both of those are very, very big numbers. Even if you have an LDL of 200 milligrams per deciliter or 2000 
nanomole per liter, you take a statin, which I think is a horrible idea, and you lower it to 100 milligrams per deciliter or 1,000 nanomole per liter, you still have one times 10 to the 17th nanomole per liter in your body of LDL. Meaning that no matter what you do, you are going to have to be a completely hormonally destroyed human. You are never going to eliminate you are never going to make your LDL small enough that there are not enough LDL in your body to initiate plaque. Right. I know it's a large number, but it is relative. You know what I mean? It's like... One times 10 to the 17th is still a huge number. Yeah, and you, I think you, if we look at we, Brownian we, we motion... That, when you talk about the scale, though, like we're, we're at those numbers with a lot of things that float around the bloodstream. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's actually... Uh, the number of LDL particles is larger than the number of cells in our body. So it's pretty huge. Um, it's a big number. I mean, I think like 10 to the 15th, like we have a lot of LDL particles in our body. And even when you push the, uh, the LDL down, there is still plenty of LDL to make plaque. And I think that the idea is this, LDL is always moving in and out of the endothelium. The endothelium is the single cell layer in the blood vessels. It's always moving in and out. It has to move into that subendothelial layer into the intima to deliver yeah. nutrients. And it's all about which LDL particles get stuck in there. So I don't think, I, I, I guess my point is that decreasing the amount of LDL in your body is the worst way to affect cardiovascular yeah, disease risk. Yeah. And if we look at drug trials, there are many drugs which decrease LDL, which do nothing for cardiovascular disease risk. So the fact that statins decrease LDL is probably not their actual mechanism of decreased cardiovascular disease risk, which is minuscule compared to what we've seen in dietary interventions. Yeah. We know that with lifestyle, we decrease it so much more. And this is something that like, just to give a, a sort of an analogy, Again, it's necessary but not sufficient. If I wanted to burn my garage down, like some flammable liquid like gasoline would be necessary but not sufficient. Like That's I could have a gallon of gasoline in my garage right. or I could have two gallons of gasoline in my garage, but it depends on how close I'm bringing a lighter to it. Where's the spark? Yeah. Yeah. And LDL, this, I talk about this in my book in detail. LDL is a valuable molecule in the human body. It's an apolipoprotein. It serves immunologic roles in the human body. In... There's a human condition called smith labile opitz syndrome in which people have very low LDL due to a deficit in cholesterol synthesis. And they get, a, they get really, really bad infections that can be improved by giving them cholesterol. You can give them infusions of cholesterol and it improves infectious burden. We've seen the same thing in mouse and rat studies. When they increase the amount of LDL in the circulation of mice and rats, they are much more resistant to infectious insults, whether they're injected with LPS, lipopolysaccharide, or the alpha toxin from Staph aureus. The mice are much more resistant to infectious insults when their LDL is higher. They've done experiments in mice and rats where they deplete the LDL, and those mice and rats die very fast when you give them an infectious insult. LDL also moves things around the body. LDL does not exist in our human body to kill us as some cardiologists would suggest. It's a valuable molecule that moves cholesterol around the body. Many people believe that we can't make cholesterol in our testicles or ovaries or adrenals. So in order to make hormones that make us healthy, men, women, that help us balance cortisol and other hormones in our body, we need to have cholesterol moving into those organs. How does that happen? That happens with VLDL turning into IDL, turning into LDL. If you don't have an LDL bus moving cholesterol through your body, you probably can't make cholesterol in some of those tissues and that's the delivery system. So people need to realize that LDL is super valuable. And the flip side of this equation is that there's a lot of epidemiology to suggest that those with the highest LDLs live the longest. And in elderly populations, LDL is protective. Epidemiology studies show that people with high LDL who are older live longer. They live longer. And these studies have been, they've done retrospective analyses to control for the fact that people will say that those with low LDL may be dying sooner because they have cancer. So anyway, it's all being yeah. controlled for very carefully. So Dr. Paul is saying, don't worry about saturated fat. That was my long answer. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Did I, did, I, did I make that yeah. point clear? Yeah. Uh, so as but, far, but there was something else. We were, we were on that topic. For I was asking else. for practical advice. Oh, that's <laughs> so practical. I'm so practical. <laughs> I was asking for practical advice or changes that you had since last time. And I think that, yeah, well, I don't know exactly. So I, I also, when I was in Oregon, I was trying to eat eggshells, like you were saying. Oh, yeah. And that sucks. Why? I don't know. It's just like, I don't like to chew through them, it felt like it took forever. Like I would have like a tenth of an eggshell. Like do you have some tri do you have a trick? Do you just have huge teeth or what? I just I get I got big teeth, man. I got a big smile, I got big teeth. Yeah, I just chew them up. And so this is a good segue. So the reason Anthony is interested in eating eggshells is because 
when I think about eating a carnivore diet, I'm thinking, how would our ancestors have eaten animals? Even if our ancestors were eating some plants, we know that ancestrally in indigenous cultures, when they eat animals, they eat animals nose to tail. Not only are they eating animals in the wild, they're eating, they're harvesting them respectfully, they're eating the whole animal. They're eating small bones, they're probably grinding the bones, they're eating bone marrow, they're eating brain, they're eating eyes. And what's so interesting about this idea is if we look at the partitioning of nutrients in animals, there are unique nutrients in different, in different compartments. I'm, I'm not an advocate, and in fact, I would say that I would discourage people from doing a carnivore diet that is based only on meat. And so one of the important- You're not a ribeye only. I'm I, not a ribeye like, only. Go, go, get ribeyes at Costco and no, only those. No, as you said, that's, I think that's, <laughs> not, that's not the right thing. It's not voting with your dollars. It's, it, there are so many reasons that grass-fed, grass-finished meat is better, regenerative ag is better. We talked about that. Eating nose to tail gives us nutrients that are unique in the various compartments. You rank the organ meats at the top of your totem pole, and I would do the same thing. They are very rich in many nutrients, which are not well represented in muscle meat, specifically folate, biotin, riboflavin, copper. Many important nutrients are found in, in organ meats, whether we're talking about kidney or liver. Then we can talk about thymus, very rich in vitamin C, pancreas. The organs partition nutrients differently than muscle meat. Muscle meat is incredibly rich. It's just not a full food, in my opinion. The other nutrient that I think is left out of a lot of carnivore diets is calcium. And we were talking before the podcast about acid-base balance. And a lot of people ask me about this all the time. It's been a fascinating kind of rabbit hole to go down. One of the critiques of high-protein diets or completely animal-based diets is that it's going to increase what's called the potential renal acid load, the PRAL, or the net endogenous acid production, the NEAP. But what's fascinating about both of these metrics is that they're a balance. The way these are calculated is as a balance between the amount of protein we're getting and the amount of alkalizing minerals, specifically magnesium, potassium, calcium, and iron, right? And so that paints things in a very different perspective. And when we think about the way our ancestors would have been eating animals, I believe they would have had calcium sources, whether it's bone meal, or bone marrow is a pretty good source of calcium. You can get calcium from animals. You can get calcium from small bones of animals, whether it's fish bones, or I think that our ancestors probably would have eaten you know, bone flakes from time to time. When we increase our calcium on a carnivore diet, we will balance the, uh, the net endogenous acid production from proteins, and we can look at things like urinary pH to make sure that we're doing this well. Many in the carnivore space ignore calcium. Some people on carnivore diets or animal-based diets can tolerate dairy. I think if you're going to do dairy, it has to be very carefully sourced and you have to uh, make sure you tolerate it. I think a lot of folks, myself included, can't do dairy. That's a whole other conversation. I don't include dairy in my diet. So the two sources of calcium or the three sources of calcium that I think of are bone broth. Kurt and I are making bone broth at the house right now. We put it in the Instapot. We've got bones with a little bit of vinegar in there to acidify it, to pull the minerals out. Vinegar. Vinegar. Well, I guess you could ferment, you know, fruit and, you know, it turns into acetic acid. Wilkes is listening to this. I know. He's like, that guy. (laughs) That's cheater. He uses Costco membership to buy a a big gallon (laughs) drum of uh, vinegar. vinegar, (laughs) So there's studies that show that when you acidify the broth in a bone broth, you will increase the amount of calcium and magnesium coming out of the bones by 17 and 15% respectively. So if you make bone broth, properly, you can get a decent amount of, of calcium and magnesium minerals in your bone broth. I also use bone meal and eggshells, as you're saying, as a source of calcium. The bone meal, you're taking caps, you're powdering it on your food, what are you doing? So depending where I'm getting the bone meal, you can buy bone meal from grass-fed, grass-finished animals. Um, it, when, you, um, when, I, when you make the bone broth, at the end of the process, the bones become brittle and you can just crush them up and eat that to get yeah, a little more. Through it. You can, oh, it's like, it becomes totally like, you can chew through it. But if bone. you buy it, you can buy it as a supplement, right? You can buy it as a supplement. And yeah. if you're going to buy bone meal, I think it's important to look at the certificate of analysis and get it from, again, vote with your dollars, get it from a farm that's doing regenerative agriculture. I'm hoping that White Oak Pastures will uh, make bone meal because they're they're doing things so cleanly that it would be a good source of that. But you can also get bones and just grind them up yourself and eat a little bit of the bone meal. You know, a teaspoon of bone meal is going to have over a thousand milligrams of calcium in it. Can people overdo these calcium rich sources? Just like anything else, of course, right? You could get too much calcium, but I think that you'd have to eat a lot of eggshells to get too much calcium. Eggshells are sometimes constipating if you eat too much. Yeah. Did you notice that? You didn't, no, you didn't I, get very far because half. you're like, I I'm can't like, eat this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did though what I did do. So it's something I left out. I had a scoop of just uh, grass-fed collagen. So I just had these ground meats and I mixed it with that. 
Uh-huh. And you just can't even taste it at all. It's just like no collagen is great. That's like the methionine glycine balance. Yeah. But I obviously this is a different thing. But yeah, I'm saying yeah. like as far as people when people consume it, they just think like you need to mix it and drink this thing. Like you can just add it to eating real meat. Oh, collagen like is add, great. Yeah, you just pour it on top. Yeah. And you don't even taste it. And I mean, collagen is in bone broth, right? So yeah. in the bone broth that I'm making today, I put some tendon. We went to the store and bought some very affordable grass-fed beef shank. I think it was seven dollars a pound or six dollars a pound. Where'd you go? Uh, Whole Foods, Whole Whole Foods in Austin. You can get grass-fed beef shank for seven dollars a pound, right? And it has a bone in the middle of it with bone marrow. You take the bone out. There's a little tendon there. You throw the bone in the pot. I eat the bone marrow on the steak that I cooked. Put the bone in the pot. Make bone broth out of it. And you you know you acidify the broth, and you can get calcium sources that way. But um, what's interesting, and going back to the acid base question, as we were talking about before the podcast. There is both research to suggest that high protein diets do not affect uh, the pH of the body, which we know that. And if you check the pH, your body in the body's pH will be very tightly regulated. But there is a good study that I found that if you increase the amount of protein in the diet from 90 to 160 grams a day, you will see a change in the urinary pH. And so what I recommend people do on animal-based diets is just check your urinary pH. And I'd like to see it above six or 6.5. If they're below six, they're probably not getting enough minerals. It's not that animal foods are so acidic. It's that we should balance those yeah. acidic things in animal foods with minerals, which we can get by eating nose to tail. And the same thing we talked about in the inverse before of you can only eat so much stuff and if all you're eating is meat, then you're not getting a lot of high mineral load. Exactly. You you're, you only need so much meat a day. I don't think people need to eat meat. And the people that I work with or talk to who are just eating meat all day don't do that well. The first well, problem is easy. That's why. Yeah, like, it is. It's, it's not easy to go. And like people are confused to go to the butcher and like do all this stuff. Not everybody has an Instapot. They didn't find the Black Friday sale. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, it, it, doing this stuff is like, it's sort of, you have to be really involved. It's easy to go to a restaurant and just order a steak. And I think that's a great way to start a carnivore diet. But you know what I also realize is that any dietary choice we make needs to be intentional. And I think, totally. it's, I think it's okay that it's not easy. I don't think it's complex. It just has four steps, well, and not just one. It's the same thing I was saying before. It's like health is simple, but it's hard because our environment isn't set up in exactly. such, such that we're like, we don't go to the store and find these things. We don't have a lot of packaged foods like that. And like people, people just aren't used to spending a little bit extra time on their food and their nutrition. It seems hard because we're not hunting animals. Right. I think that if we were in indigenous cultures and you and I go out, I'm in, I'm in Austin this weekend to go hunt. When we respectfully harvest animals, we will thank, you know, the, the universe and the environment for providing us with this nourishing food. And we will eat that animal nose to tail, you know, and that's what our, and that makes, that is so easy when you hunt an animal. It's more complicated when you go to a butcher because the butcher doesn't have a bone and a brain and a pancreas and a spleen. And I'm not saying everyone needs to eat all those organs, but you know what? Animals are packaged with all those organs together. Like it makes so much sense. Like if you hunt an animal, like we have done for the last 2 million years as humans, you're going to get a package which has all these things in it. It's already, it's very simple. It's right there for you. So as far as when you formulate and formulate this, this diet for yourself or for other people, I'm sure this is in your book that's coming out, but you know, other amounts relative, like 10% organ meats, 60%, you know, muscle meats, you know, certain fat stuff. You want this much bone, you want this much bone broth, you want this much of egg maybe, or this much omega three from maybe fish or sea sources. Like, do you have sort of a template and a guide for what people would want to do if they want to try it. Yeah, like lay it do out it in a proper way. I lay it out pretty clearly in and, my book. And, and has any of this changed over time for you? It's always evolving, yeah. which is humbling and interesting. It keeps it interesting, but it's humbling, right? Uh, I mean, I work with clients. I, I work with a lot of people on carnivore diets. I see their blood work. I see what works. I see what doesn't. And so I'm learning. I'm learning all the time. I mean, I think there's going to be a second book and a third book and maybe a book on regenerative agriculture and, you know, maybe a book on a deeper book on plant toxins. Who knows? Um, maybe a book on, I want to do a kid's carnivore book, um, carnivore for kids, but uh, yeah. And in the book, I lay out five tiers of a carnivore diet just to give people ideas. The first tier is a carnivore ish diet. Like we already described, it's a diet that recognizes that animal foods are incredibly nutrient rich and emphasizes them. It can include organ meats. I think most diets should include organ meats, but doesn't have to. And then thinks about plants on a toxicity spectrum. So as far as you're talking about the Cresser Wilkes debate on Rogan, I've actually stayed 
as far away as humanly possible from this whole game changer thing. I've not watched the I've not watched the documentary. I have not tuned into any of the debate on Twitter. I have not looked at any of the the podcasts regarding it. I just like I don't want to put any attention towards it. However, what I do hear over and over is that Cresser says, you know, there'd be two thirds plants, one third animal products, or whatever. I'm, you're shaking your head right now. So you, Not maybe, nodding. In, in the, in the <laughs> carnivore-ish, do you, is that like the flip or is it four-fifths and a fifth? Or yeah, I mean, roughly? I say like 80, 85% yeah. animal foods. I mean, that's sort of like my, my approach and how I do things personally. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like majority animal foods, 80, 85% animal foods and some plant foods occasionally. I mean, so, so I think what people probably really want to hear, they can buy your book obviously to, to learn more, but what are some of those things on the lower toxicity scale for plant foods that yeah. would be fine. Yeah. I think this is going to be individual, but I think of the non-sweet fruits and tubers on it's the- like berries. Berries, yeah. um, avocado, olives, squash, sweet potato, kind of in that less toxic spectrum. Yeah. You know what's sort of interesting? It's like I eat all those foods intuitively and I don't like huge salads. I don't like a lot of leafy greens. I don't like all that type of stuff. And like I, you, you basically just said exactly what I eat in addition to, to meat. And, and I, like, think, I, I haven't looked in the toxicity of plants like that. Yeah. And like that is exactly if you were to look like I have sweet potatoes on my counter. You can see through the window. Yeah. Avocado. I have, I have, I have, I have avocado and berries and had some squash with like a bunch of meat the other day. And that was like. Exactly and I think what that's what indigenous peoples do in terms of plants. Like I said earlier, indigenous peoples don't eat broccoli. They do not <laughs> eat kale. They just don't eat kale, man. They're not going around eating plant leaves. Plant leaves are bitter and they're, and they're just, you know, I was, walk, I was on the way over here. I was hanging out with Kyle Kingsbury today and he was saying that his wife, just whenever she eats too many brassica vegetables, her stomach gets messed up. And I was like, you know what? That's really common. And I think that it, my hope is that with the book, with the message, I, I'm not trying to convince everyone to go completely animal based, yeah. to go for carnivore. I just want to open people's eyes to the fact that there is a plant toxicity spectrum and that if you're not thriving in the way that you want, if you have stomach issues, it might be the broccoli, it might be the kale, it could be the collard greens, yeah. it could be it could be seeds, it could be beans, it could be rice, it could be these foods and you can select, you know, maybe the less toxic foods or go full carnivore and then reintroduce. We had talked about the idea of a, a carnivore cleanse. Yeah. I have something in the book I call it the clean carnivore reset. Yeah. That was um, the name of my drafted book that I'm just going to let sit there. <laughs> After going through the process of launching the last book, I'm just like, this, I'll just let that one ride. and Maybe we'll, I, I will maybe we'll up, write it together. I'll pick up a book again, book writing again when I'm retired. That's, yeah. like, that's, yeah. that, that's when I'll write a book. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And so beyond carnivore-ish, which we talked about a little bit, you know, I think that there's meat and water diet, which people could use in the short term. It's an elimination diet. I would not do it long term. There's a basic carnivore diet, which is like meat and eggs. And again, I don't think that's great long term for a lot of reasons. I think it leaves out calcium. I don't think it has attention to many of the other trace minerals, specifically riboflavin. You might get enough folate on eggs. You're probably not going to get enough, et cetera, et cetera. Because there's no organ meat or what? Yeah, no organ meat. Yeah. And so the upper, upper, the upper levels of the tiers are more organ meat. And I kind of walk people through that. And so my ideal carnivore diet starts around protein. And I think for most people, you can go between 0.8 and 1 gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. So I'm 170. I eat around a pound and a half, pound and three quarters of meat a day. Um, and I think for most people, it works out best when they have about one to one fat to protein. And again, I talk about all this in the book. I think if people eat too much protein and not enough fat, it can lead to constipation on the carnivore diet. I think we need fat. Our ancestors are fat hunters. So one to one fat to protein is a good place to be. I'll just clarify because this point gets confusing for people. One pound of meat is 454 grams of meat, but there's a lot of water in there. It's mm. only 100 grams of protein. Yeah, I feel get confused on that. Yep. And then to that, so we talked about fat, we talked about protein. I think people need to get enough salt. If they don't get enough salt, I think it's a real issue. And we've had a lot of conversations in the carnivore space about the ancestral nature of salt. That's probably another podcast, but I think people need to make sure they're getting enough salt. <laughs> and when they do that, they will be able to retain the other minerals um, just fine. And um, some salts have a good amount of iodine. Redmond sea salt has a good amount of iodine in it. I don't think it's a problem. And then I think the last piece of the equation are the organ meats. And the organs, I mean, really, fat is an organ, liver is an organ, bones are an organ. We just need to think about all the rest of the animal that's missing and try to incorporate that in an ancestral way with bone broths, yeah. with organs, with bone marrows. And I think that if you're getting enough calcium, you'll be fine. And we talked about the acid-base balance. People can just check their urinary pH. They can check their serum bicarbonate just to make sure because I, I think that those should be normal. Um, again, urinary pH should be around 6.5. 
or, or higher if you're getting enough minerals. And so that I lay it all out in the book, how to construct it. Awesome. Well, so when's the book coming out? What's the, what's the big date? The date, it should be around February 11th or so, 2020. Okay. You can, you can read each other the book at, on Valentine's Day. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. It's a heart shapes day. Yeah. Yeah. And so, or just heart. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> uh, great. And then, you know, where are people buying this book at? Amazon? It's going to be everywhere. It's going to be on Amazon. Again, it's called The Carnivore Code. Unlocking the secrets to optimal health by returning to our ancestral diet. This is the cover you with your shirt off, flexing? No, you've seen the cover. I didn't ever show you the cover of my book. <laughs> was it a line or something? It's a, it's my face on half, and then a tiger's face on yeah, half. It's pretty cool. I'll show it to you. Yeah, yeah. There's no pictures of me. You flexing give me in the book. an advanced copy. I mean, I'm, I know. I'm gonna. It's coming, man. It's coming. I'm gonna get you a t-shirt, advanced copy. It's the, gonna be the out. The t-shirt in has like you know when it has like abs and everything like that. <laughs> it's, it's of you. And it's, then I can just wear like you. Know, yeah. All no. no, my t-shirt. My t-shirt was actually inspired by what you guys did at Paleo FX this year. It says "Stay Radical" in the front, in like '80s, uh, like lettering. Cool. You're gonna, you're gonna like it. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. So the book is called The Carnivore Code. It'll be available everywhere. You can go to thecarnivorecodebook.com for kind of a landing page for it, and you can go to my website, which is carnivoremd, to get all my social media stuff. Everything is linked there. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. And thanks for doing all the work, you know, hard work and like continuing to evolve. Like you said, like a lot of people find these things that get dogmatic and I think that you're the most reasonable human in the carnivore, carnivore oh, space. You. And like, again, my favorite representative. Thank you. So thanks for everything you do, man. Appreciate it. It's been a fun process, man. And I'm happy to be wrong. Like I, I, I'm willing to be wrong. Um, I hope I'm wrong because then we'll understand what's right. But I, I think that we need to keep the conversation going and I think it's a worthwhile one. Uh, well, cheers to some turmeric ginger shots here. <laughs> <laughs> See you, buddy. See you, man. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Natural State Podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, I'd really appreciate you heading over to whatever service you're listening to this podcast on, dropping me a five-star review and your thoughts on the show. This helps us get discovered by more people and spreading the good gospel of health. And if you want to stay plugged into all of my self-health experiments, recent research in books that I'm reading and my interpretations of those things, products that I'm testing and thoughts on all things related to health, check out my free weekly newsletter called The Feed. You can sign up for that at dranthonygustin.com slash The Feed. That's dranthonygustin.com slash The Feed. Thanks again for tuning in and your support of the Natural State Podcast.